Okay, well, thank you to the Lost Hills Wild Ones for inviting me to share about the wildflowers of Fowler Forest. Um, I'm gonna start my screen share here and get the program going. It has been a beautiful spring at uh, Fowler Forest. And uh, if you've not had a chance to get down there, I'll share a little bit more about where it's located. Um, if I can get my program to move. Sigh, how come it's not moving? Wait, maybe it will. There we go, we're good. Okay, so um, Fowler Forest Preserve is located in southeastern Woodbury County, and it is a beautiful, about 160 acre preserve. And uh, if you look at here, Smithland, Iowa is actually the oldest town in Woodbury County. And uh, just to the, the west of that on Highway 141 is the entrance to Fowler Park. And the, the main area of focus of the, of the area is the wildlife refuge and preserve area that has some great upland forests um, and the hiking trails um, throughout. So you get a chance to um, see a little bit more about that as we move along. I wanna share and give tribute, of course, to a couple of great resources that I've used to create this and that I use extensively and share throughout um, my programs. I do uh, work at the Dorothy Pico Nature Center in Sioux City, Iowa, and my uh, job and role there is Education Program Director with the Woodbury County Conservation Board. So many of you are from the area and are real and uh, aware of that, but I wanted to just put that out there for those folks out there that might not be from Sioux City or Iowa and um, give you a chance to get a little bit of a, a of a frame of reference. So um, our resources, of course, would be the Wildflowers of Iowa Woodlands by Sylvan T. Runkle and Alvin F. Bull that was originally published in 1979 and then reprinted in 87. And the shape of that kind of looked like this one down here at the bottom of my screen, that kind of style. And that was printed by Iowa State University Press and the binding wasn't always the best. Well, the, the forest one was better than the prairie. Um, and then um, it was a reprint um, done in 2009 by the University of Iowa Press, and that's the main one in the forefront with the gorgeous um, columbine on front. And uh, there was a little bit extra more photography that was uh, contributed to that. And um, I know Tom Rosberg and um, Carl Kurtz, uh, Larry Stone were some of those contributors as well. Um, there also was then the complimentary copy um, to the Wildflowers of the Tallgrass Prairie, also by Runkle and uh, Dean Rusa was uh, the, um, the, the co-author with that. And then the second edition does have additional ones, and those are all by Thomas Rosberg as far as the features and the photos. Um, the other guide that I've been using, too, is from some of our neighbors to the south in the Omaha, Nebraska area. There's a field guide, guide to the wildflowers by, of Fontenelle Forest and Neil Woods Nature Centers by Roland E. Barth and Neil S. Ratzloff, published in 2004 by the Fontenelle Forest Nature Association. And, and uh, I've not been there personally for a few years, but I did purchase them there directly from their gift shop. But you could Google their website and get that. And they also have the guide to trees, shrubs, and woody vines, grasses, sedges, and rushes of Fontenelle Forest and Neil Woods. So although they're um, a southern neighbor, keep that in mind, not all the species in those books um, references are in our little bit farther north, 90 miles north area. So those are the references I'm using. And I'm also going to share this disclaimer that's coming right from the uh, Wildflowers of Iowa Woodlands book and also the Wildflowers of Iowa Prairies is the disclaimer that um, it does share some of those historical uses of our plants, both the prairie and the forest. And obviously, they don't recommend that they're used for those purposes today. Our, our wildflowers are treasures, and I know you all agree with, with that. So we want to make sure that they are um, secure and they are protected. And that you're, one, being safe in that not, not uh, harvesting them for foraging, especially if it's in a preserve or a state park area. Um, and to make sure and know that and I might make some references in my programs today about what the Native Americans might have used them for, or the early settlers, but that's not something that we recommend that you do because, for one, they were experimental and may not have been actually um, turned out as a good result. Um, and uh, second, obviously, again, is just for the long-term preservation of our, our precious natural wildflowers.
So let's go to Fowler Forest, shall we? And this is a photo of our beautiful upland forest. I wanna share um, as we go that we have some unusual little different species down at, at Fowler Forest and it's only, you know, 45 minutes from Sioux City. It's farther south, but the red oak, Quercus rubra is um, native there. And it's along the Little Sioux River Valley. If you go and look in Sioux City and go to Stone State Park or go to Bacon Creek Park, we do not have red oaks that are native in those forests. So um, it's kind of neat to be able to just go, you know, less than an hour's drive of Sioux City and see native red oaks. So it's a, it's a beautiful abundance that we have there um, within Fowler Park. And if you look, the red oak family does have the pointed lobes on the end of those lobes. And the acorn itself um, doesn't have that little furry furry cap that we're used to with our bur native bur oak. So bur oaks are also found in Fowler Forest. Um, but so we have the red oaks as well. And incidentally, there's a, a species of mammal, the eastern chipmunk that's found along the Little Sioux River Valley corridor and farther east. But here in Sioux City, we do not have our friend, the eastern chipmunk. So just a little FYI, a little trivia there. So this is the one of the staircases that comes off the back of the uh, public restroom area at Fowler Forest. And I didn't, I want to note that just yesterday, actually Friday, April 30th, our, our um, all of our parks in Woodbury County Conservation Board areas, including Fowler Forest, the gates now open and the pressure hours water system should be all turned on. I know we are having some issues with our restroom at Fowler Forest, so I don't know if it's actually open at the moment, but typically our parks are open on May 1st. We open them a day early because of it falling on a, a Friday. So, um, this uh, staircase is in some need of repair. And so also note, if you do take this trail, do not rely on these, unfortunately, on these railings because they are kind of getting rusted out and they're not real safe. Sorry, they're not OSHA approved and we need to address those, but um, it is nonetheless a beautiful park for you to visit. Um, and the, the forest floor is just a lush carpet. You would just be amazed. I was, this photo was just taken a week ago. Um, I was down there on Saturday, the 24th, um, taking some of these photographs. And um, again, it's just really an abundant, beautiful, diverse woodland um, that we have within our, within our grasp, not very far from Sioux City. And this is one of the favorite topics of mine is the spring ephemerals. And ephemeral really is meaning a fleeting, very short lifespan. So those beautiful little flowers are emerging before when I showed those filtered sunlight coming through the trees, before those um, trees are getting those leaves. Um, Bloodroot is our first bloomer in our forests here for the most part in, in our Northwest Iowa forests. And I was very fortunate to capture this image just last Saturday. I was surprised there were still a few blood roots blooming. And this one I think was almost perfect. I couldn't imagine a better um, better shot. So I was really happy to see this. But blood root sanguinaria is our, our genus, meaning bleeding, referring to a blight red, red juice that comes from its root if it's broken. There's some other common names that you might've heard before, red, Indian red paint, red pecoon, red root, turmeric, all sorts of different things. It's in the poppy family. And uh, these were taken, uh, earliest I've seen bloodroot bloom since I've been in the Sioux City area for almost 33 years. I took these on May 20, or excuse me, March 29th. And they came um, out of Stone Park and in areas you can see there's really no duff there. This was burned last fall. So obviously that brown or that dark soil um, right in the location where it was in the park, we're able to allow these um, guys to sh just pop up out of the ground. And there is a shot of that root that um, has been broken. It did, uh, it did get disturbed. It was in a disturbed area, so I, I wasn't out there actively digging up this plant, but I thought, well, it's already out. I'm going to take a picture of it. And I reburied it, hoping that it's going to do well on its own again. But you can see that red sap oozing from the root. Again, a member of the poppy family and uh, small colonies, so these will bloom starting in March through May. And uh, if you look at those leaves, they kind of are tiny and unfurl, and then they get the shoot coming up with that beautiful white flower. Um, you can see them in, in different uh, abundance throughout our woodland forests. And as those flowers then um, produce the pod and the seeds, they're going to wither and die, but the leaves are going to get much larger. So here's a nice image of, a, of the, the colony of, of bloodroot flowers throughout. Next one I'm going to share about is our toothwort. 
And toothwort is also, um, I love I love the genus Dentaria because it reminds me of teeth, obviously dental, but unfortunately they changed it on us. So now it's cardamine. <laughs> cardamine is actually the genus and uh, consonatinata, conca canada. Sorry, I'm not having a good time pronouncing that. But lasciniata is much easier for me because it's uh, referring to more of the torn leaf. So um, I, I left those up there because I appreciate uh, knowing a little bit more about that. This is in the mustard family. And if you know those four petals, another great name for this is crinkle wart, um, crinkle root, excuse me, and uh, cut leaf tooth wart or pepper wart because the actual tubers of this uh, plant are kind of peppery tasting. Um, again, we're not talking about harvesting or foraging these, but this is um, one of the flowers that's found native throughout our forest. I'm not really seen it in Stone State Park. Um, maybe some others have, but I have not found it. I have, I do know that's pretty, very abundant at, at uh, Fowler Forest. Again, um, they gathered those tubers to season for soups and um, because it's in the mustard family, it'll have numerous little seeds that'll just, the capsule will mature and they'll just burst open and spread throughout. But you can see a good view of those toothed leaves and uh, there's some of their, just the leaves on its own. So there's our tooth wart. Um, again, last week was just really spectacular seeing um, these throughout the forest. This is another one of my favorites, the Dutchman's Breeches, and it's just named for those little tiny butterfly-like flower shape that looks like, like some pantaloons or um, little breeches. Boy breeches is another name for it, or kitten breeches, and it's again in the poppy family. Dicentra meaning two spurs, and those would be the spurs here on the flower. Um, and it's just a, a beautiful and a delight. In fact, you're going to see this beautiful, ferny, undergrowth of their um, vegetative state and they're going to be in a kind of a pinkish to a white color it just depends i found some that were pretty darkly colored pink last week and look how beautiful those are um, again this being in the poppy family the roots of the plant are poisonous and uh, exposure of it could be harmful i know that sometimes they talk about blue staggers that wildlife or wildlife or your cattle might be grazing on this and having problems um, easily identified if you have a plant in your garden called the bleeding heart, you might see that it's kind of similar and recognizable to that, but that the leaves themselves are just very smooth. There's no hair on them at all. And they're just a really beautiful kind of a blue green. I do want to share a little bit about the spur and the neat. We talked a lot about native pollinators in this group. Bumblebees are a pollinator of this flower. And uh, they are gonna be able to push up underneath that. I think of this other image is a better shot. So they're gonna push up underneath this waistband part of the pants, if you will, and get up in there with the proboscis and uh, get that nectar out and their fuzzy little bodies. However, some of them don't have long enough proboscis um, on those bumblebees. So you might see some little holes up here in the spurs. Um, and those are, those are uh, bumblebees that are cheating to get to the nectar. And unfortunately, when they cheat, that also means that plant's not getting pollinated. So keep that in mind and take a look while you're out there. If you witness some holes in, in your um, Dutchman's Breeches flowers, it's probably because a bumblebee was being sneaky and not doing his full job, but getting the benefits of that nectar. So there's a, just a beautiful shot of, of the forest floor with an assortment of lots of different wildflowers, including a, a nice stand of Dutchman's Breeches. Now we're going to share a little bit about bellwort, and bellwort, I love the genus on this, uvularia, uvula, if you all open your mouths, ah, no, don't do that, but in the back of your throat, you've got the little dangly little ball back there, that's called your uvula, uvula. and um, it's named appropriately because uh, we talk about the shape of the flower kind of being similar like that bell sh shape dangling down. Grandiflora means large, big flower, and this is a common, fairly common wildflower. It's very common in, in uh, Fowler Park. I have not seen it in a lot of areas in Stone Park, um, but it is found throughout Iowa, and uh, it's a member of the lily family. Mary Bells is another name, yellow bellwort, straw bells, and doctrine of signatures in Runkle's book. They share a little bit about that. 
Um, many times the plants were named because of shapes, and again I talked about the uvula, and then because of that they thought perhaps that it was a treatment for throat problems. And this sometimes was serendipitous and true, and other times not. So if you look at uh, an abundant flower that's to the east of here that we don't have, unfortunately, because it's beautiful, the hep hepatica is also known as liver work because the, the leaves are kind of liver shaped and they thought that would help cure liver problems. Again, not necessarily true, but it's a fun, fun little tidbit of our, of our um, native history. Um, the young shoots on this plant um, cook, are cooked like asparagus in the Native Americans and the pioneers. And uh, again, it blooms April through June and just got some pretty images. I love the yellow with the purple um, popping there in the forest, but we have some some really beautiful um, times to get down there. Still in the next week or so, you might still see a lot of these plants blooming in our Fowler Forest. Next, we have Dogtooth Violet. Uh, another name for this, and I call it more so, is Trout Lily and Erythronium. And the lily family again, Trout Lily, Adder's Tongue, Deer Tongue, Thousand Leaf, White Fawn Lily, many names for this. And if you look closely, you can see the liver colored spots um, kind of looks like the modeling on the back of a trout a fish. So that's one name for the trout lily. But they're just extensive colonies and they'll come up just with a single leaf. Um, and that single leaf may be just a single leaf for up to six years and then it's going to get two leaves. And then those two leaves, it could take another up to six years or more before they produce a flower. Uh, the bulbs of these plants were really important for Native Americans. They ate them um, as a starchy tuber or starchy bulb. And uh, look at that flower when it's wide open. It's just really spectacular. I love that, the stamens and the anthers on that plant. Um, very nice. But uh, I, I was just thrilled last week when I was down there because if you look and can count, I think I counted 17 blooms or more just in this one photo of dogtooth violet. And that is really unheard of in some ways because it's so, like I said, it takes a long time for these plants to bloom. So you know that we have a very beautiful, abundant colony of dogtooth violet down at uh, Fowler Forest. There are some spots in Stone State Park where there's a lot of them as well. Unfortunately, um, the wildflower selection right around the Dorothy Pico Nature Center is not really that great. Um, it takes a bit of time for us to find some of these flowers right along there, but you can just see that whole mass of colony and the hillsides on some of those areas when you just come up from the picnic area, just full of the dogtooth violet. So get out there and check those out. Blue cohosh is another one that's, it's really distinctive and easy to spot because it has, the, the colors are just so different. And this is in the barberry family, but if you look at those uh, compound leaves and how they're lobed, kind of has an anemone looking kind of look, but it's a kind of a yellow green color. And the flowers themselves are an unusual color of yellow, yellow green as well. Now, when they produce a berry, they're gonna be a bright blueberry. Not necessarily edible, but um, blue ginseng, papoose root, scraw root were other names for this plant because um, they would be using them to aid in childbirth, some of the different Native Americans. Um, they make a tea out of it and brew it for helping women with their disorders and their, their female time or that. But here's another um, view of our blue cohosh. And it does need a little bit more moisture. I do, we do see this in obviously Fowler Forest. I see it in Stone State Park. And it's pretty um, easy to spot because it stands up a, a lot taller than the rest of the carpet of the forest floor this time of year, especially for the most part. So you're gonna find this one pretty easily. Now, Jack in the pulpit, that's really distinctive and it's the Arum or Calla family. And Trifilum, Trifilum means three, so we have three leaves, but if you look at the jack, you've got the spade and the spadix and the jack in the in the pulpit. Indian turnip is another name. Whoops, I went too fast. Sorry, go back to those three, three leaves. And these are big leaves, very robust. Um, so when they're first emerging, you'll see them coming up smaller and then they'll these, these leaves will out, be out in the forest for quite a while at this stage. Um, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. There we go. 
Uh, my apologies. So when you take another look at that Jack in the Pulpit, as it gets to be um, later in the summer and the fall, where that Jack is inside of there, if it's pollinated, it's going to have a cluster of bright, bright red bearings. And obviously later, um, September, October, when you're hiking, you won't necessarily see those leaves any longer, but you'll see a stalk with these bright red berries. And the there's calcium oxalate crystals within those <laughs> red berries. So um, one of the stories I like reading and, and hearing about in, in Runkle's book, book is that years ago, most country boys learned the hard way because they were in, encouraged by the more experienced that tasting the raw, raw bulb of those plants, excuse me, not necessarily the berries, but the bulb of the, of the plant, produces a severe stinging sen sensation described as a Mouthful of red hot needles because of those calcium oxalate within the, the bulb. So it's not something that you necessarily want to eat, but uh, they did um, they did use that for a food source and also for an entertainment, apparently. Okay, sweet William. But who doesn't like that beautiful that beautiful purple face at you? And this a note the shape of the flower and also there's five petals on this plant. So it's a member of the phlox family. You call it phlox. Phlox meaning flame. Divericata, divergent or spreading as they will spread out. Um, blue phlox, wild blue phlox. There's also a cousin, the prairie phlox. Um, but look at the variation in colors. So this is more of a lilac lavender. This is more of a bluish lavender. It just kind of depends on where it's growing. Um, April through June, it's blooming right now. If you get out there, you'll see it throughout Stone Park and Bacon Creek and at Fowler Forest. There are many garden varieties of phlox. And there's, again, the prairie phlox I mentioned. Um, I love it that it's a polymoniaceae, the, the phlox family. But if you look at those beautiful petals, they're actually just kind of curled up. And they just kind of untwist and open to that beautiful five-petaled flower. Um, there's a similar flower that is an invasive one that's been planted extensively along the roadsides because it's pretty. It's a little shade of different shade of purple, and that's known as Dame's Rocket. And Dame's Rocket is not in the Phlox family at all. It's not a cousin. It's actually in the mustard family, related to that toothwort that we saw earlier because it has the four petals. And uh, again, because it's in the mustard family, have the faith of the mustard seed, those tiny, tiny seeds that go everywhere, they get spread pretty quickly. So if you have Dame's Rocket, um, it's beautiful, but remember it's, it's not native, it's invasive and it will go like crazy. So this is the native phlox that has five petals and just a beautiful flower in our woodland area. Next, we have our columbine, and uh, we have the Aquilegia canadensis, Aquila, meaning the eagle. Uh, I like to share a little bit about the spurs on here. It kind of looks like an eagle talons, eagle claw. It's in the buttercup family. Bells and clucky and honeysuckle, jack in the trouser, all sorts of funny different names for this beautiful plant. It has been extensively um, cultivated throughout, so you can get lots of different varieties on them and purchase those but our true wild columbine is one of those that's featured on our plant sale that many of you are going to be getting here pretty soon probably and um, again it's just really a distinctive beautiful scarlet um, a lover of our native um, pollinators and also hummingbirds so you'll see it throughout a variety of habitats in our forests um, in in our area so um, it's a cousin to the uh, blue columbine, which is the state flower of Colorado, but this is our wild columbine. How about this one? Everybody recognizes our lovely little violet or Johnny jump ups. The blue violet, viola species, um, many of those throughout in your gardens. We've got various shades of purple to blue to violet to white and yellow. Um, little subspecies of that. Um, again, it's blooming. All parts of the, the leaf um, are heart-shaped, easy to recognize, and the flowers, um, you can gather. My sister gathers these flowers every season. She made her first batch a couple weeks ago of violet jelly. So if you collect two cups of just the blossoms, 
that it takes for the batch. So that's a lot of picking little tiny violet flowers. Um, but you make a, a concoction and, and steep them overnight and then strain out the flowers. And it's depending on the color of your violets, it can turn to be a beautiful plum to rose to lavender colored um, jelly. So I'm sure I'll be getting some violet jelly when I next see my older sister, Stacy. I know many of you know Stacy. Um, I shared the recipe with her years ago, but she, she uh, does it as a tradition each year with her, her kids when they were little, picking violets, and now she continues on her own. So here's a yellow violet and then a white violet that compliments of Carrie Radloff from her yard. So um, the pioneers used to make a tea from this if they had a headache, and it turns out that compound salicylic acid is found in the leaves, which is where if you look at the compound that's in aspirin, salicylic acid. So it did work out that this helped with headaches or fever fevers. And we also have a cousin to this one in the prairie. I don't see, it's not an image of it blooming, but you will definitely see the flower looking very much like the purple violet. And this is the bird's foot violet or the prairie violet coming up right now out there. Okay, Solomon's seal. This one is um, another member of our lily family and it gets quite tall. It can be over six feet high, but because of its big arching and it's a heavier plant, it's gonna be nodding. So it might only be three feet off the ground, but if you extended that stem way out, it could be up to six feet tall. So biflora meaning two flowered. And uh, this is one of those that is edible and those flowers themselves are, turn into little berries. Um, it's found throughout the state. This is a, a short one I photographed last week and those flowers are kind of yellow greenish. Fruits are blue black berries and uh, there's a cousin of this. I showed a picture of this to a friend of mine that lives up in Alaska and she goes, oh, you have watermelon berries. I said, well, is that what you call them? Well, up here and then when I was up there last summer I found them and I did eat some of them and they kind of taste like watermelon um, but they're more of a reddish kind of like a watermelon color berry <laughs> that color pinky color um, they didn't really taste as much as watermelon as as I thought but it was they, they were they were pleasant so um, here's a showing one of the uh, flowers coming off and that will be dangling down below once it gets larger so there's our Solomon seal now, cousin to that is a starry Solomon seal, and also there's another version, another species of the uh, false Solomon seal. So this one, also in the lily family, star-like, stellata, meaning star-like, it's going to bloom and have its flower just at the end of this one top leaf axle. Another name for it is zigzag, and if you look at that, you can kind of see the zigzagging on that. So we're looking down above the dorsal view and then you've got those little flowers coming out of the end whereas the Solomon seal was underneath the plant um, leaves and coming consecutively behind underneath each leaf this is coming out on the end so um, Rissimosa is the taller and that's going to be known as the uh, false Solomon seal this is the the star Solomon seal and uh, again those root stocks were used for by food um, on the um, stellata, they're going to have kind of a purple berry or blackberry with white stripes, and they'll be just at the end of the, the stem. Pretty distinctive. There's one that's just starting to bloom, kind of, kind of dorsal view of that. Solomon seal. Another one, I love black licorice. Sweet Sicily is also known as wild licorice or licorice root, long style sweet root anise root, osmorrhiza, and um, longestylis is the sub is a species that's the more of the licorice smelling. It's in the parsley family, and if you look at that, it has lots of root, lots of hairs. It's on its root. If you take a little bit of, of the leaf and you crush it, it smells like the wild licorice. Or the taproot will have a similar licorice odor. Um, there's fine hairs at the nodes, and those fine fern-like leaves so they're very uh, much toothed and dissected and they also have kind of a purple air purple color in their stem beautiful cluster of white flowers and um, the osmorrhiza longestylis is going to be more anise flavor and there's another species the claytonii 
It's similar, but that's more of a parsnip flavor or odor that you'll you'll have. And those more of the Claytonia is going to have more of the hairs on throughout all of the the plant leaves as well, and not just on the stem. So that's probably Claytonia. Ah, now this one we've been seeing a lot of. You see a lot of this. One of the first things to emerge in the spring as far as its vegetative state with those leaves. Um, and Virginia water leaf, Hydrophyllum virginianum, hydro meaning water, and fillin meaning leaf, so watermarked. And you see those little white marks on those leaves. It's kind of as similar to if you um, have a cold drink and leave it on your coffee table without a coaster, it leaves a watermark. Um, again, one of the first to emerge, but it will not bloom until yet here coming into mid-May or so. I haven't seen any blooming clusters yet in the park, but pretty soon with this heat that we've been getting and the sunshine, we should be getting to our, our water leaves starting to bloom. And those beautiful bell-like clusters, but look at those stamens are really long. Um, flowers will be white to lavender and they are a favorite of pollinators. Um, again, the uh, Native Americans and early pioneers did eat the, the leaves themselves for like a salad or a green. They are edible. And look at that dense, dense colony of uh, water leaf blooming, uh, the Virginia water leaf. Just really a beautiful woodland flower, quite abundant throughout Fowler Forest and Stone State Park. We do have a lot of this out at the Dorothy Pico Nature Center. And um, some beautiful images there to see see those stamens and uh, definitely a, a favorite of our native pollinators. Next we have the wild leek which is in the lily family as well but the allium is latin for garlic and wild leeks are edible and they are like a garlicky onion. They're really quite delicious. I grew up um, eating wild leeks. We would go out and gather Morels and my dad would uh, also just uh, take a few of the wild leek and so we'd have a nice batch of morels and have the leek with uh, an accent uh, to help with sauteing other vegetables and really a, a really robust flavor. Um, another common name for wild leeks is ramps. And uh, again, foraging is something that you want to be very cautious about doing. You want to, if you have your own property and have that, then that's your prerogative, but uh, note that in our native forests and our state parks, there's no um, harvesting or foraging or digging or that type of thing. Um, nuts, berries, and uh, mushrooms are allowed to harvest in our state parks and our preserves. Um, but here's a, a great assortment of the wild leeks throughout um, Fowler Forest in different areas and <clears throat> quiz behind it. Excuse me. <clears throat> there's our tall bellflower or bellwort behind it, or not bellflower, bellwort behind it, the large flowered bellwort, and just beautiful assortment with some ferny um, dustman's breeches. We've got violet, we've got Virginia water leaf. Again, it's really a, a beautiful place to go. Now, some of the not so beautiful flowers, but I wanted to share a few things as far as what you're gonna be seeing out there too and, and other places, our stinging nettle. Urtica means to burn, and obviously if you've ever been in contact with stinging nettle, you know that it can burn. It's like little mini hypodermic needles that are on the stems and underneath the leaf um, axles. So another common name is itchweed, but it is an edible plant, especially the tops, the nettle tops. You can harvest those um, carefully, and you can eat them raw in a salad. They kind of have a peppery, cucumbery taste, I think. That's what I think they taste like. Um, but again, know your own tolerance. And uh, they have a square stem. Again, they're covered with those stinging hairs. Um, they're important for fiber, making rope and cordage. And the flowers are very nondescript. They're just tiny green, green flowers, very similar looking to like a, the flowers on some of our trees right now, like our oak tree. So um, they're gonna have their clusters from the upper leaf axils when they bloom. The other nettle that we have in our forest is the wood nettle, different genus Laportia, and in the nettle family again, their leaves are more oval shaped, and look at how toothed they are as well. Um, the male and female flowers are in separate clusters coming from the upper part of the leaf axils, 
And the male flowers on this are whitish and the females are green. Um, and I like this image because it shows our down here in the foreground and the center, the stinging nettle. Look how it's much more of a lance shaped pointed ends. Um, it gets very much taller than our wood nettle too. And then our wood nettles here in the background, how we've got the oval shaped wood nettle. And I think the sting on the wood nettle is almost worse than the stinging nettles. But either way, it's good to wear protective clothing and know what they look like to avoid them in the forest. This one here in the middle is a little bit of our sweet Sicily kind of coming through there and an oak leaf. So we've got um, both the wood nettle and the stinging nettle out there and now we have the antidote for them the jewel weed or impatience uh, jewel weed is really a, a beautiful flower it does it does tend to grow more in the moist areas and uh, it just has if you notice those water droplets sitting on there it has a beautiful very smooth there's no um, hairs at all on these leaves and the the stems are hollow and they're filled with the watery fluid and if you break some of that off and you rub it on your your itch from your um, stinging nettles which is instantaneous by the way when you come into contact with that stinging nettle or the wood nettle it's uh, definitely going to feel the burn right away or if you have a mosquito bite insect bite you can rub some of that jewelweed it's kind of similar properties to like an aloe vera plant so it relieves that itch and there's a beautiful close-up of the leaf itself showing the jewels as far as that goes and the the seeds of uh, the flowers i don't have an image of the flower blooming um, but then once they go to seed they have a um, the little capsules the seeds kind of just spit, burst open so when you touch them their husks are kind of adhesive and they just psh, they they will just explode and it's fun to find those ripe pods and just barely touch them with kids and then just watch their eyes light up as those those little seed pods will explode in their hands it's pretty fun uh, another uh, shrub of our Fowler Forest and within our uh, forest at Stone Park and Bacon Creek is the wild gooseberry. If you get up too close to it and back up to it, you might get goosed by those spines or prickles. And you can see some of the flowers blooming right now. They kind of have dangling blow. The leaf is very kind of a palm shaped, um, similar rounded lobes and they have the spines on the branches the fruit is edible it's very sour when it's green but when it turns purple it's very um very pleasant and they use them a lot it's in the current family so they use them a lot for uh, jellies jams gooseberry pie if you can beat the birds to them but typically when i'm on a hike with the kids and the wildflowers we might just sample some of the green ones and see if they're daring to to see how how sour they are um, another one to look out for when you're out there is our poison ivy. And poison ivy is found abundantly throughout our forests in the Midwest. We in Iowa we do, not have, do not have poison sumac in our area or poison oak, but we have poison ivy growing in different growth forms. Um, this is an early shoot here of um, the leaves. When they first emerge, they're kind of reddish in color, but they're always going to be in three leaves. It's a compound leaf, the single stem in the middle, and uh, usually once they get older there's a little bit of red in that in that leaf stem as well. All parts of the plant have that oil on it, the urushiol, that if some people are sensitive like me, we know how to avoid it because it's not pleasant to have poison ivy. It doesn't make you itch and sting right away like nettles, so you have that benefit of if you're out in the forest to make sure and wash really good. If you think you've been through poison ivy or not, it's uh, good to, to keep that in mind and just wash your skin. I sent my young son in once because I knew he was climbing a tree with poison ivy. It said wash really good and he was probably four and he washed like this apparently because he got the poison ivy in between his fingers, the blisters. And I was like, oh, let's talk about hand washing skills. We've all been getting good at that obviously for the past year with COVID, but um, Lesson learned from that mom. I should have helped scrub those hands of that youngster because he was kind of miserable for several several days. Um, but here's a growth form of it as a vine up a tree, and that's a pretty stout vine. You can see the vine has a lot of root hairs on it. Very easy to spot. Um, and here's the leaves as they're getting more mature. And if you notice that single stem in between that is kind of a reddish tinge, uh, these do um, turn a beautiful orange and yellow and red in the fall, so 
If you have youngsters that have to do leaf collections, keep that in mind as well. Don't go harvesting those beautiful colored poison ivy leaves for your leaf collection without gloves. Poison ivy. Okay, some other threats to our native forest and prairies. A couple things. Um, obviously, we do have more um, invasive species than ever. And the harvesting, I mentioned earlier, harvesting of forest foraging improperly, done, done improperly, can be a problem. Those are just a couple couple of our um, threats. But one of those that's becoming more prominent in our region, and thankfully I've not seen it yet at Fowler Forest, but that's probably just a matter of time, is again a member of the gut, of the mustard family, the garlic mustard. And um, those young plants kind of look a lot like creeping charlie or violet leaves. And this is a second year plant because it's blooming. But note the four petals. It's highly invasive and it does have a garlic smell. So that's another tip that you can can use to identify it, um, but the seeds can remain viable for well over five years. Here's the first year growth form and notice how those leaves do kind of look like creeping charley leaves or violet leaves, kind of heart shaped, with a little bit more wavy ends, edges on them. So that rosette is going to grow, they're a biennial, so the first year they're not going to bloom, but this is showing the second year. And note how it becomes more mature, those leaves are getting more slender, more andal shaped or triangular shaped. And there's the bud of the flower just getting ready to bloom. And here's um, kind of a full growth form of it in the forest with the white. It's not the most um, uh, crisp image to see and discern those, but you can kind of see the, um, oops, I thought I had another image of it. I'll go back, um, kind of see how those leaves are getting. We're trying to control it a little bit by um, pulling it before it blooms. Um, but the best thing too is to keep in mind if you're hiking in areas or walking in areas where there is garlic mustard present to clean your boots off really well or your shoes so you're not spreading those seeds to other areas. But it does kind of can take over some of our native forests. Um, a threat to our prairies and our grasslands and pasture lands is the leafy spurge, Euphorbia esula. It is a um, member of the um, Euphorb family. The plant itself is native to Eurasia, and it came over probably with some, some hay. Who knows for sure exactly, but those leaves are kind of a blue-gray, and if you look out right now and see this plant, it's blooming, and people think it's, might think it's beautiful, but if you really know what it is, it's not so beautiful. Um, it does have um, a pretty robust underground root system, so... There's not a lot that will control it. Um, they've used some biological control on it. And if you do pick the stem, you'll see that it has a milky sap that exudes from that. Here's uh, kind of the hillside. This was a few weeks ago at Stone State Park from the burned area from past fall. And um, you just see all this yellow green cluster starting to bloom. And this, now they're really in full bloom up there. Um, but uh, they've had some flea beetles that they've brought in for a biological, biological control. It's been somewhat helpful. They're really tiny and they attack the root systems, but um, it, it does take up quite a bit of extensive stuff. And one of our members, Diane Blankenship, can probably share a lot more about our leafy spurge and the problems we've had on that. Now I want to just share this one of my favorites. It's not found at Fowler Forest that I'm, that I'm aware of, but it's our first bloomer in our prairies at the Lust Hills, and, and I just love the past flower. So I wanted to share a few images of the past flower and thank one of our members as well, Dottie and Bill Zales, for allowing me to come up and take some photographs of some of their beautiful past flowers, the anemone patents, patents um, in the buttercup family, windflower, Easter plant, prairie crocus, and there's our friend Dottie um, <laughs> across from her house. I think it was Millie's Prairie, I don't remember. And then we have this beautiful cluster of our past flower and note our little native pollinator on it. So with that, I'm going to conclude my portion and uh, see if you have any questions for me. This again shows some of our beautiful dog tooth violet. And if you want to learn more, I do have some others that I probably featured on our YouTube channel. If you just um, Google Dorothy Pico Nature, Nature Center on YouTube, you'll see some of our content. We don't have a ton yet, but we did have a 2020 Fowler Forest hike, wildflower hike, 
um, that you can go and view at your leisure. And again, I believe this is recorded and will be on eventually on the Wild Ones page. But I want to thank um, Teresa Croyd, my coworker, and Carol Blair had a photograph in here, as well as Carrie Radloff and Olivia Parks, who was our AmeriCorps intern that's now in the Black Hills. So, uh, but other than that, most of the photographs were taken by me. And I will open it up and uh, see if they have any questions.